In this episode of Cycling Tours, I will explore the cycling network within the eastern sector of Passer Ris. Hey everyone, and welcome to the longest episode of Cycling Tours, featuring the east side of Passer Ris, which is significantly larger than the west. Therefore, we wind up with a video that is nearly an hour long, featuring a bike ride that lasted nearly two and a half hours, which I shall try my best to narrate consistently throughout. This video was really hard to make, thanks to the disastrous quality of the paths here, on both the network and infrastructure levels. Network-wise, the paths do appear to cover the eastern half of Passeris pretty broadly, but along the way, many strange branches and interruptions makes for an abysmal intra-town cycling experience, which I will show you throughout this video. Infrastructure-wise, some of the paths are very bumpy. A few require you to dismount and push, while others feature needless vertical and horizontal deviations that make for an exhausting experience on bikes. This raises many questions about why the paths are built like this. Well, we first have to understand that although this is the third town featuring cycling paths built by the Land Transport Authority, it is the very first new town in Singapore to attempt to build cycling paths, under a town council initiative. I hope that by looking back at the stories behind the construction of these paths, we gain a better appreciation of why passeries ended up having such a sprawling but highly unusable cycling network for even trips within the neighbourhood, as we will see today. As I pass the Passeri Sports Centre and go on the bridge across Sungai Tampanis, I shall start off looking at a shed path along the southern side of Passeri's Drive 3, which forms the Passeri's Park Connector, an integral part of the Eastern Coastal Loop, which was launched in 2008. It's worth noting though that this stretch of the Park Connector didn't used to come in the form of a shed path. Before Passeri's Drive 3 was widened from 4 lanes to 6, there used to be a dedicated Park Connector path, that was physically separated by a row of trees from the footpath. But unfortunately, the car brain is too strong and the road was widened in the past few years. The land taken by the park connector path and the rows of large trees were set aside instead to add one more lane to the westbound roadway, making this park connector less pleasant to cycle. Feel free to check Google Street View or some of my bus hyperlapses out of Passeris, recorded in the mid-2010s, and you'll get what I mean. Outside downtown east, an entertainment hub opened in the year 2000, the park connector switches sides at the intersection with Passeris Close and Passeris Drive 6, where I'm about to cross the first of seven unnecessary traffic lights along the park connector. More on that later. The pedestrian crossings were widened to accommodate the high recreational cyclist volumes here, which is good. 
However, I will have to make a brief detour to continue along the park connector in the year 2024 due to water pipeline works. We then see a path with a concrete and asphalt side, which forms the same path as the original park connector built in the late 2000s. The drain gratings are obstacles which I have to avoid to ensure a smooth ride. So it's a good thing that this path is now painted as a shared path, which provides more room for cyclists to pass each other. Unfortunately, cycling here will also feel much hotter today than just a few years ago, as an entire row of rain trees with large canopies were chopped down to make room for one more lane for the eastbound roadway. The puny ferns, shrubs and trees to my right just aren't a good substitute in terms of greenery, and especially shade. And I doubt these plants are as good at mitigating the urban heat island effect of such a densely built up area. I have to come to a lengthy stop at this intersection with the second unnecessary traffic light along Passeris Rise, waiting two whole minutes, going to show the lengthy traffic cycle times used here to prioritize true motor traffic. Residents living in Sea Horizon, Sea Estar, and Watercolors to my left also drive in and out of this access road here. The funny thing about this is that if the Passeris Park connector is routed to stick to the southern side of Passeris Drive 3 instead of the north, I would not have to wait at this intersection at all. And we will see this happen again, five more times in the coming minutes. Passing the watercolors condominium, porous fencing and path markings are used, which helps to ensure that residents exiting by the side gate here can be better seen by passing cyclists. In contrast, the adjacent Sea Strand condominium obscures exiting people, which could make things a little dangerous. Crossing Passeris Drive 4, the park connector I'm travelling along here is in the form of a reconstructed pavement, with rather bizarre markings that serve to confuse rather than guide passing cyclists and joggers. The cycling path here is demarcated by two continuous lines, one in the middle of the path and the other along the right edge. However, the shared attention zones are so lengthy that it is not clear where a cyclist should be travelling when bypassing a bus stop. Should one imagine an imaginary track? or follow the keep left rule. Nobody knows. It would have been better under such situations if either the cycling path is demarcated in a solid shade of red, like a typical cycling path, or better yet, if the entire path is marked a shared path. This is supposed to be used for recreation anyway, and shared paths are better for people to cycle side by side along a path with a limited width. As part of a diversion due to the construction of the Changi Northern Corridor, the Luoyang Park Connector now runs through Luoyang Lane to my left, where I made my third unnecessary crossing. After passing it though, we get to a stretch of the Park Connector, borrowing the drainage reserve of Sungai Luoyang. I am now approaching the intersection of Luoyang Way and Passeris Drive 2, and this is where the park connector experience falls apart. 
To improve traffic flow, a direct pedestrian crossing here was recently removed, and yet the park connector was not realigned to the southern side of this road, which at this point is a much better route to run a park connector, by eliminating the 4th and 5th unnecessary crossings along the way. Right now, I need to cross this intersection 3 times, just to continue along the Passeris Park Connector, delaying us by 3 full minutes. This results in a really bad cycling experience, as I wait in a hot and humid car-dominated environment. Passing Luoyang Bus Depot, I encounter a fairly steep upslope, something which you can expect as I approach the eastern corner of the new town. Once again, I have to cross Passeris Drive 3 using the two separate crossings, due to the way the road geometry is laid here to enhance the experience of motorists at the expense of other road users. Laying the park connector adjacent to the public housing estate to the south would have been better, as it would have made this six and 7th crossing unnecessary. But alas, I have to rest in between two seas of cars as I beg to cross the road. have saved 9 minutes if I didn't have to wait at these 7 needless road crossings. That's a huge difference! I could have got here in 14 minutes instead of the 23 minutes which I took to travel from Passeris MRT to the eastern end of neighbourhood too. Anyway, things start to get a bit messy from here as I approach the construction site of the Changi Northern Corridor, featuring a new road viaduct along Luoyang Avenue. One day there will be cycling paths and a bus lane here. But at the moment, the Tampanese Luoyang Park Connector has been completely decimated by the road project and the need to accommodate the traffic volumes along Luoyang Avenue, many of which heading towards the Luoyang Industrial Estate or the Airport Logistic Park of Singapore. The funny thing about this road project to expand its capacity is that just a few years back in 2017, there was a road widening project here to expand Luoyang Avenue from 6 lanes to 8 lanes. The fact that this has not fixed traffic here, now that we are building pretty close to the housing blocks to my right, has prompted the authorities to build another viaduct on top of the Luoyang flyover. This would result in a rather unsightly mess for residents living directly next to this road. But really, no traffic problems will get fixed until the cross island line is opened, because trains are more efficient and reliable at moving people than cars, and often faster than buses. Till then, driving may just be the only way for many of the workers here to get to work, 
simply because a public transport journey is way too slow for those living on the other corners of the island. I will briefly travel along Flora Road, where I encounter a really wide cycling path that has been painted on a white existing pavement, which I suppose encased a drain. This cycling path is about 3 meters wide. It would be nice to see cycling and footpaths of such skills elsewhere in Singapore, built to be more spacious than the existing minimum widths, but they are really rare to see in Singapore for some reason. The only thing I don't like is how interrupted it is. I'm breaking the laws here by not stopping at each of these driveways before moving on. For now though, this path is just a stray one that doesn't actually lead anywhere. So I will have to briefly travel on the footpaths along Old Companies Road and eventually Loyang Avenue. The carriageway has already been widened to the point where it is directly adjacent to the footpath. There is very little room for roadside trees here, making a walk or ride pretty unpleasant. It's insane that this road is clogged with cars on a Saturday afternoon, with zero transit priority. It literally could not be widened anymore without eviting the dozens of landed housing owners to my right, going to show the futility of accommodating the automobile. Will the viaduct fix traffic? or induce more of it and make it even worse. Viewers watching this in 2029, do let me know in the comment section below. I shall now travel westwards along Pasiris Drive 1. Together with Pasiris Drive 3, this roadway forms an east-west axis for transportation through this new town. And it's also the case for cycling, though the cycling path is pretty bad. It gives up at bus stops and staircases. But when you compare this with the town council paths that I will travel on later, even this may seem to be pretty good. It's worth noting that under the remaking our Heartlands program for Passeris back in 2017, both east-west roads are identified to be key nature ways, where connectivity should be enhanced throughout the town. But it will not be possible to travel through it seamlessly today, as I approach the construction site of the Passeris East MRT station of the Cross Island Line. A section of Passeris Drive 1 has been closed to vehicular traffic to facilitate its construction since October 2022, and likely till the second quarter of 2028. But that's not the case for pedestrians and cyclists. A temporary shed path was built along the periphery of White Sands Primary School. It doesn't quite lead to the other end of the construction site at the intersection with Passery Street 12 and Drive 4, coming to an end at the void deck of 197 Passery Street 12. We will see where the other leg of it goes in a short while, but in the meantime, let's move on to Passery Street 12. The cycling path along that street, a cycle track as it would be called back in the day, was originally mooted in 1996 by the Singapore Institute of Architects as a model town for redeveloping newer estates under a Ministry of National Development initiative. 
It was eventually built under a Pasir Ris 21 Community Mall project by the Pasir Ris Pongo Town Council between 2001 and 2005, 4 kilometers long and for $2.7 million. However, already in 2005, there were complaints that it was not cyclist-friendly. We've got bollards and deviations along the way. It dumps me at the edge of 192 Pasir Ris Street 12, placing killer litter within firing range of my head before moving back onto the ground level. Not many would use this path when the footpath is more conducive for cycling. At 198 Passeri Street 12, one block away from where the shed path abruptly ended earlier, it reappears again, making many deviations around construction hoarding. But hey, at least it's there. It's not very good for sure, but at least there's an effort to maintain some semblance of a cyclable path here. The cycling route continues briefly along the north side of Pasir Ris Drive 1, where I pass Pasir Ris East Community Club and the neighbourhood centre of Neighbourhood 4, completed in 1988, consisting 440 to 446 Pasir Ris Drive 4. This will be the first and last traditional neighbourhood centre to be built in Pasir Ris, as those which came after it comes in the form of a shopping mall. It also fronts a rather terrible cycling path. Moving westwards, I'm not even sure how I can comment about it at this point. There are just so many interruptions, some pain and some physical. Approaching Sungai Tampanis, the cycling path switches into a shed configuration on the southern side of the roadway as part of a path diversion away from the construction site of the Passeri Station on the Cross Island Line. Relative to some of the construction sites which you will see in a short while, the path here is pretty smooth and direct. The only thing which slightly concerns me is the metal drain cover which is located within the shed path. You might want to be careful to not ride on it, as you could slip and fall. They are also not built to withstand the weight of bicycles and can get pretty dented over time.
At the junction with Pasir Ris Street 51, the shed path switches back to the north side of the roadway again. What I find interesting about this temporary shed path, as indicated by those neon orange regulatory signs, is that it goes to show that Singapore is capable of quickly building road-level bike facilities that feel safe. Just look at these concrete barriers placed on the road to delineate the boundary between the main carriageway and the shared path. In many other countries, such concrete barriers can serve as temporary installations that instantly create a protected bike lane by carving road space from motorists. While they don't provide the most pleasant of experiences, placing you very close to the exhaust fume of vehicles, they are a rather cheap and quick way to implement cycling infrastructure. Suddenly, we have a glimpse of that community mall path as we pass the Pasir Ris 1 precinct. I'll get back to it later, but in the meantime, let's speed up to Pasir Ris Street 51 where we have a stray cycling path leading to nowhere. Maybe one day this path will go beneath the Pasir Ris flyover onwards to Tampanese Avenue 12. Just maybe, but today it just ends here for some reason. Well, as it turns out, this path forms a 400 meter long southern section of a central greenway, linking northwards to Pasir Ris Town Centre and Pasir Ris Park via the future Pasir Ris Mall, along a great separated route on the northern end. The walking path, decked with human-scaled furniture on the other side of the pillars holding the MRT viaduct to my left, was completed in 2023. But this cycling path was already here in 2017, paralleling the Costa Ris precinct to my left. Let's just say that although it's relatively well paved compared to some other monstrosities in Pasir Ris, it's terrible. Many blind spots await us, the path can't even accommodate two passing bikes and it's such an afterthought that it doesn't show up on any official cycling path maps or legislation. I'll spend the next 3 minutes of this video wrapping around the cycling path along the town centre of Pasir Ris. Well, at least that's what's there according to official cycling path maps, but they have since vanished thanks to the construction of Pasir Ris 8, an integrated development that's supposed to house a town plaza, retail mall, bus interchange, and the condominium itself while forming an integral part of the central greenway. All these developments are good, but they have not come to fruition yet, and the substitutes for the original shed paths are clearly abysmal. So I'll just stop talking as I show you what they have become. I'll reconvene at the 30 minute and 30 second mark.
Welcome to Passerine's Drive 4, where I'm travelling along a cycling path built under Phase 2 of the network here, under contract RP228E, which was awarded in 2013. The path cuts through the heart of Passerine's neighbourhood 4, the earliest neighbourhood here to be built, starting in 1988. This was during a period when the Housing Board was aiming to develop picturesque housing estates with distinct characters, and it shows in the facades of the housing blocks within the heart of this neighbourhood with more varied colours and textures at the roof level, end walls and ground floor entrances. There was even a system which was used to classify how public housing here is designed. A category for special designs for buildings in good locality or with an excellent view, another category for those with distinctive forms along major roads and vista points, and a last category for the remaining ones with basic designs. The attention to detail is truly there. I'm sure you enjoy the good urban design qualities that this town has. The same can be said about the cycling network. Pardon me as I rudely interrupt this questionable ride to make a detour to Seashell Park. This neighbourhood park contains a cycling path branch from the Community Mall project in the early 2000s, which ends abruptly at 445 Passeris Drive 6. The Community Mall continues where the cycling path does not, but it takes a very convoluted route across the town of Passeris to the point where it is practically invisible unless you attempt to follow it on some ancient map. But the route is extremely hilly and leads to a dead end, making this spur route useless for the vast majority of bicycle commuters here, even on an intra-town basis. Passing the Asperis, what little remains of the community more completely disappears, and with that the width for cycling as well. It is ridiculous that this bus stop, which was reconstructed in 2022, was built like this. They had one shot to fix the cycling network here, by removing the bus stop bay and letting buses stop in the middle of the leftmost lane. This would free up room for a proper cycling path while speeding up bus commutes, as buses no longer have to give way to vehicles when exiting the bus stop. But that didn't happen, and I ended up having to bypass the bus stop at an odd angle. I shall now move to the east side of the same street as indicated on one map, there probably used to be a cycling path running here, but I'm not quite sure which one is it. Perhaps it's this very crooked path paved with bricks, but it sure doesn't feel right to be cycling through this as a means of commuting. The cycling track is hardly visible as I pass under 213 Passeri Street 21 in the range of Kula Little. There's no need to speed through this place when what used to be a cycling path here is routed through this maze of railings at a steep slope, to the point where you would still need to dismount and push anyway. I will now travel on what used to be a town council cycling path, forming a part of that community mall, which I'll give the name of Nautica Park Link for this video. However, today it's just a pedestrian linkage, with a couple of outdoor seating and fitness equipment as you will find in a modern housing precinct. 
Would it have been better if this stayed as a cycling track? Do let me know in the comment section below. Approaching Passeri Street 21, the cycling path starts again right next to the eastern end of Nautica Park Link, an obscure hint of the route which it once led. Not that this path is good, as I have to keep merging and splitting from the footpath. In case you are not aware, I did a recce of a significant portion of this cycling route, which is why I can record my pass through Nautica Park in one shot. But the cycling network is so fragmented here that I have to cut the video at times as I make mistakes. You can blame town council incompetence for this, but to be honest, their hands were tied back then. The Land Transport Authority wasn't keen on even building off-road cycling paths, so all the land required for such paths have to be sighted away from the road reserve. So the town council can't touch the road and have to make do with public housing land. At this car park entrance east of 204 Passeri Street 21, I have to dismount and push because even after two decades, apparently nobody has ever stopped and thought, gee, do we need a raised crossing or a curb cut? Now, to be fair, when the cycling track was built, cyclists were legally required to dismount and push at even the smallest of road crossings since they were not allowed to cycle on footpaths. Stumbling blocks like these, by themselves, are capable of self-enforcing legislation like that. But times have changed. This should never have been allowed to be a thing that yours truly have to negotiate around in 2024. Meanwhile, the shared path along Passeris Drive 2 is ridiculously narrow. It also meets the intersection with Passeris Drive 3 at an odd angle, both horizontally and vertically. The segregated path design isn't any better, as the footpath becomes laughably narrow in such situations. Very little thought appeared to be given to how it would interact with Luoyang Point, the neighbourhood centre of Neighbourhood 2. But at least I don't have to dismount and push thanks to such stumbling blocks, am I right? Gosh, the bar has been set so low. Now, it's worth noting that this video was recorded during the late afternoon, close to evening. At around this point in time, it was starting to dawn on me that the cycling path network here is a lot more lengthy and worse in quality than I originally expected. Coupled that with poor traffic signal progressions, and my cycling speed got extremely slow. So pardon me if the video gets a little noisier from here, as the sun gradually sets. As I travel along Passeri Street 11, there are no hints of the cycling path until after I pass White Sands Primary School. This is a friendly reminder that legally, e-bikes and e-scooters are banned on footpaths, so riding them here is illegal. This is why, despite a sprawling intra-town cycling network, you rarely see people riding those sorts of devices in Passeris, because there are many large gaps in the network in reality, although it may appear continuous on the map. Traffic volumes on many of these neighbourhood streets have also gotten higher, which makes cycling on the road pretty scary for everyday people.
at the intersection with Pasir Ris Street 12, I'll cross over to the south side of the street to continue travelling on those dreaded community mall cycling paths. At this point, it should be painfully obvious why the vast majority of cyclists here stick to footpaths. The cycling track is probably the safest place for a pedestrian to be here because no cyclist in their right mind would ride on this other than yours truly. At this intersection with 137 Pasir Ris Street 11, I once again have to dismount and push around bolas and a sharp curb drop as I pass some neighbourhood driveways. The path continues to wind around, testing the patience of whoever that's riding through here. Now it's worth noting that at certain points where the path ends, you may see two circles next to each other. They are stubs which used to be bolats, and it's probably a good thing that those are removed as they are ableist infrastructure that are a pain to negotiate around for wheelchair users. Of course, such a move also has the risk of endangering pedestrians, but with such sharp corners and such thick rumble strips, it's unlikely that the cyclists will be able to travel fast here anyway. Crossing Pasir Ris Drive 1, I now move along Pasir Ris Drive 6, where there is a Pasar Malam in my way. This is a very common method of setting up such temporary roadside fairs by repurposing shared paths. However, you don't see such events organised on the road. Road closures for vehicles for Pasar Malams seem to be unimaginable in Singapore for some reason, but it have helped to bring a little bit of that car-free Sunday vibrancy to the heartland and provide residents here a respite from the noise and pollution of motor vehicles. Continuing, the cycling path will stay further from the road than the footpath as is typical in this town. This is not optimal as it puts people in uncomfortable proximity to vehicular traffic and active mobility devices in uncomfortable proximity to the building fence. It's worth noting that the footpath here is ridiculously narrow such that it is a squeeze to walk side by side. Its design goes against human nature, and this path should have been a shared path. The bus stop bypass is also very dangerous. The odds are that you will either collide into one of these pillars or risk falling into the grass. Yes, 
because that's a shadow of me doing a hand signal. It's a good practice to do that on the pavement to signal your intentions. Anyways, I shall now pass Downtown East, a leisure and entertainment hub that is the largest in the vicinity, opened in the year 2000. I would like to bring to your attention what appears to be a continuation of the Pasir Ris Park Connector, running through this path east of Pasir Ris Close, at least according to one map. The pub is also supposed to serve as part of the Round Island Route. In reality, there are no visual differences between this path and a typical footpath, which goes to show that whatever is published online may not always reflect reality. I will take this time to wrap around Downtown East, including The Resort, a resort, and Wawa Wet, a water theme park, which are part of this entertainment hub. The route involves me briefly passing through Pasir Ris Park, on the way to the part of the Tampanese Park Connector, which is found in Pasir Ris. Passing a bunch of cocks and hens, I want to point out a rather bizarre proposal for passeries dating back to 1992. Under the development guide plan for Changi Point proposed by the Singapore Institute of Architects, Loyang Bay, as the coast of passeries is called, will have reclaimed land to create lagoons, coves and bays, with waterfront housing and marinas on top of what has taken shape in downtown east, likely similar in style to what Sentosa Cove is today. This is all to match the rising aspirations of Singaporeans, but I guess that didn't work out. I'm now along a stretch of the last park connector to be covered in this video. The Tampanese park connector dates back to quite a while back and forms a stretch of the eastern corridor, following the drainage reserve of Sungai Tampanese. You may see a few laminated signs saying Eastern Corridor along the way. While the concept of an Eastern Corridor connecting Pasir Ris Park to the East Coast Park is new, this park connector is not, as parts of it were already opened in 1997, very early into the inception of the Park Connector Network program. 
Together with Sungai Api Api, Sungai Tampanis forms one of two river ways, as identified in the connectivity plan of Pasiris, under the Remaking Our Heartlands program in 2017, and enhancements have been made to Pasiris Town Park on my right. Now, you may think this is a great recreational and even accommodable cycling route, but at the moment it is not. As I approach the construction site of the Cross Island Line's Pasiris MRT station, I have to make multiple detours crossing this bridge to get to the paths on the other side. It's worth noting that this bridge and this path I'm turning into do form a part of the very obscure and crooked community mall which some of the cycling paths were built under. Crossing Sungai Tampanis again, I have to continue to take a mindering path, passing beneath 547 Pasiris Street 51. It is worth noting that the diversion route is pretty terrible, involving a mud track which is not rideable at the moment for the shared bike. So I'll make a detour taking the covered lingways, one which might or might not have broken the town council bylaws in this town. The journey along the park connector continues and we can see how the variety of building forms here along both sides of the river, consisting of blocks of different heights, add to a picturesque view of neighbourhood 5 to my right and neighbourhood 1 to my left. All these were intentional by the planners of generations past. Unfortunately, we won't be able to admire it for long. Even this park connector journey is not completely smooth sailing. As I approach Tampanis Expressway, I will have to cross Sungai Tampanis first and head on a path leading to a pedestrian overhead bridge across the expressway before continuing onwards to Tampanis New Town. It will be necessary to dismount and push, at least until a cycling bridge is built to link Pasiris with Tampanis in 2026. Clearly, the completion of the Eastern Corridor, as announced recently, was a pretty arbitrary milestone and there are still many discontinuities to the route. As I near the end of this video, I find it appropriate to give my thoughts on the state of the cycling paths in Pasiris. Simply put, they are the worst in Singapore and potentially the worst in the world amongst those with a comprehensive cycling network. Other towns in Singapore don't have a network that is as consistently bad as this, with bollards and curbs serving as death traps for cyclists and ridiculous alignments borrowing adjacent properties, asking for accidents beneath housing blocks. I guess that's what you get in the pioneering town in having such a network in Singapore. As we return to the town centre of Pasiris, I come to the end of yet another episode of Cycling Tours. Feel free to discuss what you think about this arguably atrocious network in the comment section below, and consider using the super thanks function of YouTube if you are feeling generous as well. This is Transit Evolution, signing off.